that we will see him next time inshallah some other time brother has an أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي أنزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق ونور عرشه أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتاب المجيد وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إنما المؤمنون الذين آمنوا بالله ورسوله ثم لم يرتابوا وجاهدوا بأموالهم وأنفسهم في سبيل الله أولئك هم الصادقون صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات على محمد وعلى محمد All praise belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I thank him for granting us this life and this ability to recognize his greatness and to be able to participate in it and to be able to sustain the onslaught of trials and tribulations that come towards us due to the ignorance and foolishness of mankind. And of course we seek refuge with Allah from our own foolishness and our own ignorance. For so many a times we've done things that we shouldn't have done and we cause other people harm and we seek protection and forgiveness for that. At the same time we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us from interactions that may lead to all kinds of problems in life. As you know, people who are going through divorces and child custodies and so on, it's a very painful experience. And I was just meeting different people having such problems. And you listen to the stories of what's causing these destructions. And you realize it's so stupid, it's so dumb, there's such benign issues. That on a grander scheme of things, it's so childish. But unfortunately, that's the reality that we live in, and we have to deal with it. And of course, we have to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us wiser and to make us more patient. As Luqman says to his son, you know, Wasbir ala ma asabak inna dhalika min azmil umur. Be patient, you know, with what will come towards you, and it is a difficult task. This world is short lived. And while we have children and we have future in our generations, we wonder what our responsibilities are. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reckons everything and he will bring everything to equity and give reward beyond measure for those who struggle and those who suffer. As you know, tonight, my respected sisters and brothers, is my last lecture here. I'm going to miss you all. Uh, it's been a wonderful electric um, Ramadan for the last two weeks and I would like to Sincerely uh, thank our respected Sheikh Bahraini and his family and uh, the community for all the kindness and of course my respected brother Maslihat who has been a wonderful host in ensuring that we're comfortable with my parents here living in the house next door and it's such a blessing and we appreciate that. We appreciate your kind words, we appreciate your patience with us and we appreciate your diligence and your good spirits. Uh, it's nothing but a blessing. So well, that's a testament for while this world is a difficult place to live, the consolation and the, um, you know, the, the pleasantries of life, meeting good people, gives everything good hope in the future and it also enables us to stand upright and do what we do. In tonight's lecture, I'd like to, and as you know, by the way, just a quick note, tomorrow is the wilad of Imam Hassan ibn Ali alayhi salatu wa salam, salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Um, and I would, inshallah, tomorrow somebody else will be presenting, but uh, in, in the sense of celebration in this blessed month of Ramadan, and as you know, on the 17th of Ramadan is when the famous battle of Badr took place, which was the first battle fought by the Holy Prophet uh, against the Meccans who came to destroy the Prophet, uh, but uh, the Prophet uh, 
succeeded in defeating the Meccans and the ratio was three times the army size versus the Holy Prophets was one third. But Allah is showing us that when you're resolute and then you have a firm belief, you will destroy the enemy even though they're larger. And the verse that I started with tonight, which is, is also in Surah Al-Hujurat, Allah, the, pri- the previous verse, as I mentioned yesterday, in Qalat Al-Arabu Amanna, قُلْ لَمْ تُؤْمِنُوا وَلَكِنْ قُولُوا أَسْلَمْنَا وَلَمَّا يَدْخُلِ الْإِيمَانُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ Here, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِن تُطِيءُوا اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ لَا يَلَتْكُمْ مِنْ عَمَالِكُمْ شَيْئًا إِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ The desert dwellers say that they believe. قَالَتِ الْعَرَابُ Now the desert dwellers, as you know, they were quite ignorant uh, in many ways and uh, they were rough on the edges. But nonetheless, they had become believers, alhamdulillah. Uh, and they claim that they believe. And Allah is telling us that the religion of Islam is a verb more than a noun. Although it is a noun, it is a verb. It's a transactional religion. It's a religion where the value of an individual's faith is based on what they do. So I can declare my Islam, I can claim to be a Muslim, but if I'm not a proactive Muslim, if I do not promote good and demote evil, then I'm not a good Muslim. Now, sadly, nifaq, which is hypocrisy, comes within Islam. If we were to address Islam as the true religion, then those who don't practice it within it and who are actually destructive in promoting good and, and demoting evil, meaning they're promoting evil and demoting good, then such people are known as munafiqeen. Infidelity in Islam in its highest form is not Christians, Jews, atheists. Infidelity in Islam in its highest form are the hypocrites. They are the most dangerous. They are the biggest infidels ever. While those who attack Islam from outside as Christians, Jews, if they attack, Being Christian, being Jew, Jewish, being Hindu, being Buddhist, uh, being an atheist, being an agnostic is not an attack on Islam. Please understand that. There's a big difference when somebody proclaims a different faith, but they don't attack you. Islam does not consider them to be infidels. Infidelity are those who attack the religion of Allah especially within Islam when they fabricate ideologies that were not brought by God, when they fabricate hadith that is untrue, when they take the Quran and mistranslate it in order to suit their whimsical notions. Those are the people who are in infidels according to Islam. Here Allah in the Quran, He says, Do not say you believe, rather say we submit. Because the religion of Allah is action-based. So when we teach our children, we not only tell them you're a Muslim, but you're a Muslim based on action. The more action you do, the better the Muslim you are. And inshallah, if you continue to be good, and inshallah, if you continue to purify yourselves, then you will be considered among the God-conscious, the pious ones, the chosen, the the zahid, you know, the muttaqi, right? And of course, shuhada. And one needs not die to become a shaheed. You can be alive and become shaheed. That's a very, very high level of existence. When you're a shaheed, when you're alive, you would think that you're a shaheed, meaning you're a martyr when you're killed. No. Martyrdom is also when you're alive. Because now you have t- given totality of submission to God. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So Allah gives us a condition that say you submit وَإِن تُطِيءُ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ And if you obey Allah and His Messenger, then your deeds are intact. Now we as a Muslim population need to encourage each other as Allah in Surah Al-Asr says بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وَالْعَصْرِ إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَفِي خُسْرِ By time mankind is at a loss. By time, meaning we have finite time on this earth and we're quickly getting older. And if we do not move 
towards a positive lifestyle, then time will have eaten away this gift of God. So God is saying, well, asr innal insana lafi khusr. By time, mankind is at a loss, except, I mean, there's an exception. And one quick footnote, and I always mention this, when the Quran gives a negation followed by an exception, it's a very powerful verse. It's a wake-up call. Whenever God negates, followed by an exception, it's a powerful call. La ilaha illallah is a powerful call. There is no God but Allah. It's negation followed by an exception. It's powerful. Meaning, pay attention. And if you look at the logic of such a sentence, what Allah is doing is He's canceling all possibilities and focusing on the reality. Hence the cancellation. When the Quran cancels something, followed by an exception, it's putting focus. See? قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا Say, I want no reward from you. إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَى Except that I want you to have mutual love with my near ones, meaning the a'imma and the family of the Prophet that was chosen to represent after the Prophet. It's powerful. So the Quran is saying, focus on that. That's important. Okay? You find, وَمَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ مِنْ أَجْرٍ you know, when Prophet said, we want no reward from you. Our reward is from Allah. But you'll find the negation followed by an exception is powerful. So here Allah says, by time man is at a loss. It's a negation. Except, إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالْحَقِّ وَتَوَاصَوْا بِالصَّبْرِ So the conditions are, who will not be a failure? One who believes, one who does good, promotes justice, and promotes patience. So our obligation is proactivity. You cannot just claim to be a Muslim. Now, let me make a quick point here as a side note, because it's important. You will notice that when we become Muslims and do shahad attain, it's a blessing. But to think that because we put a stamp on ourselves by doing shahad attain, I've become a Muslim or Muslima, meaning now I'm exonerated, I am immunized for any few, uh, further scrutiny is the furthest from the truth. What we end up doing is if we think that the religion of Islam is a noun, it causes a paralysis in us. We feel I've become a member of this club, I've been given the ID card, I'm now stamped Muslim, that's it, I don't have to do anything. And that's why the Quran is, is saying, Qalatil Arabu Amanna, they stamped it. God says, no, 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 no. قُلْ لَمْ تُؤْمِنُوا وَلَكِنْ قُلُوا أَسْلَمْنَا Faith has not entered you. When does faith enter us? When we do transactions. When we pray, faith may not have entered. But it's amazing. When you pray, sometimes you feel the presence of God. And that's a transaction. It connects you. When you give charity, sometimes we give it because others are doing it. But then it touches you. And faith starts to enter you. When you start doing good deeds, faith starts to enter. What ends up happening is when faith starts to increase, Allah says, لِيَزْدَادُوا إِيمَانًا مَعْ إِيمَانِهِمْ قُلْ هُوَ الَّذِي أَنزَلَ السَّكِينَةَ فِي قُلُوبِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ He it is who puts tranquility into the hearts of believers. He increases their faith upon their faith. لِيَزْدَادُوا إِيمَانًا مَعْ إِيمَانِهِمْ Pay attention to this increasing of faith upon faith but many of us say no i already have faith i did my shahadatain i'm muslim notice the quran is challenging that if i already have faith then how is god increasing my faith upon my faith if faith is a zero-sum argument where you cross the red line and it's a noun and i become muslim then why should god increase my faith upon my faith know that what Allah implies is that Iman is transaction-based. It's a verb. It's action-based. It's constant. Where you're constantly looking to do good deeds. You're constantly looking to eradicate evil. That transaction is where Iman is built on. Now here's what ends up happening as a result. And some of you may not like it, but it's the truth. And I stand to be challenged on this matter. Is we have a habit... If it's a noun, I'm Muslim, therefore whoever's not done shahadatain is non-Muslim and we name them kafir. Generally, oh, they're kafirin. 
قل يا ايها الكافرين يو نو قل يا ايها الكافرون قل يا ايها الكافرون لا اعبد ما تعبدون اي دونت ورشيب ذات بيتشور ذس اي قل يا ايها الكافرون الله سبحانه وتعالى از ادريسينج ذوز هو اتاكينج اسلام ذوز هو هاد اني ماسيتي تو اسلام كفر has many forms i want to introduce it briefly tonight for us to understand our muslim obligation first and foremost islam as a religion has been named appropriately it's not named after a person or an object christianity is named after a person judaism is named after a person as you know christians are named after christ and the word christ is actually a greek word christos So when you're a Christian it means you're a follower of Christ. When you are a Jew you are a follower of Judah, the son of Jacob. Judaism. When you're a Buddhist you're following Buddha. Now following a person is not wrong but notice the nomenclature, the naming convention. In Islam would you not say then logically we should be Muhammadans? Right? Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa alayhi right? But we're not. We're not Muhammadans. We are Muslims. Allah says, Al-yawma akmaltu lakum deenakum wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati wa raditu lakum al-islam deena. Today I perfected for you your religion and completed my favor and I call it the religion Islam. Allah says, Sammakum al-Muslimin min qabl wa fi hadha. We named you Muslims before. and we name you muslims now you say you follow this religion islam but al islam while it's a noun in its proper form its action is all verb so i advise us all let us not be quick in drawing a red line that i'm muslim therefore you're not muslim and because you're christian you're jew you are a non believer and suddenly now we plaster them with condemnations and the sad thing on the reverse is that we've got criminals in islam and we protect them with all the crimes and sometimes we say radiyallahu an they burn the kaaba radiyallahu an they kill the prophet's family radiyallahu an they cheated the prophet radiyallahu an they disobeyed the prophet radiyallahu an This band-aid plastering business comes because we consider Islam as a noun and we give entitlement to each other and therefore even if you become a horrible muslim it's better than an honest just non-muslim this is not the religion of god sadly even in indonesia you find we have this myopic idea that when you have a christian governor but he's just and he's fighting corruption but because he's not muslim we cannot follow him because we've entitled each other but we'd rather have a corrupt muslim a thief a liar a cheater you look in pakistan you've got leaders that have amassed the majority of the wealth of pakistan they're muslim leaders corrupt to the core but it's okay go to the umayyad history and see how corrupt the umayyads were see how corrupt the abbasids were they were the most corrupt people on earth but does anyone condemn them people revere harun ar rashid when he was a murderer he was a genocidal killer why he is muslim he did shahadatain let's protect him but he's a murderer he's a thief he's a liar he's a cheater yeah but immunity immunity let's be vigilant about it and let's go condemn the other non muslims this is why the sickness of society has come because we haven't seen what the quran is telling us quran is saying you have hijacked this religion this is not the religion of allah you have given yourselves entitlement and it's not only within islam christians do it jews do it buddhists do it hindus do it they all have the same disease where they entitle themselves and condemn the other side Whereas Allah says, "كل حزب بما لديهم فرحون." Every army fights for its own cause. But who allowed us such ideology? This is beyond me. And I look around us, and I see why we, as a human race, have gone so astray because we want to protect our own interests and use the name of God as validation. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. How do we gauge society? I have Christians friends, Christian friends, Jewish friends, atheist friends. 
I gauge them on their akhlaq. But do I say it's okay you don't believe in God? No, we encourage them to believe in God. When I go to Christians, I don't condemn them because they believe in Christ as the Son of God. I encourage them to come to the oneness of God. Oh, people of the book, do not say three. Come. Come, let's have a dialogue. No condemnation. But I've seen Christians who are more honest, more giving, more loving, more caring. I've seen Jews who've stood in front of caterpillars and gotten killed because of the occupation in Palestine. They are Jewish people. You might say all Jews are bad. No, anybody who says all, anything, it's suspect. It's a stereotypical broad brush that has nothing to do with truth. You should never say that. It's conditional. What is the akhlaq? What is the behavior? Now, Quran addresses people of the book, addresses Christians, and says there are among them, you give them a heap of gold, they will return it to you. Now, why is the Quran staying there? Why does Allah says, Inna ladina amun wa ladina hadu wa nasara wa sabi'in man amana billahi wal yawm al akhir wa amila salihan? Indeed, the believers, the Jews, the Christians, the Sabians, provided you believe in one God in the day of judgment and you do good deeds, don't worry for you. There is a good place for you. You would say, this is bold for God to tell me this. Should I not be promoting Islam? Exactly. That is Islam. When we look at each other with the eyes of grace, and we look at people of other faiths, and when we talk to them, and someone says, I don't believe in God, it's okay, let's talk about it. How can I convince you? Am I going to hell? I said, I'm not the master of the judgment. Atheists asked me that, Hassanin, am I going to hell? I said, listen, I'm not, the day of, I'm not the master of the day of judgment. God is. But I'll tell you, He loves you because He created you. And He sustains you. And He feeds you. Whether you reject Him or accept Him, it's irrelevant. He's too merciful. Now it's up to you to accept your own destiny. You don't want to accept it? Don't. There is no compulsion in religion. And you will answer your Lord on Judgment Day. But my obligation is to invite you. The way my Lord said, Ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah wal ma'idatil hasana wa jadilhum billatihi ahsan. Invite them to the way of your Lord with kind exhortation and wisdom. Wisdom and kind exhortation. Kind words. Come. Here, when we have Christians coming in our community, they were serving us two days ago. Some of them are leaders who run multiple churches. They were not arrogant walking around, I'm a big shot. They were wearing gloves in the kitchen, toiling and sweating and serving. They felt empowered. In the eyes of Allah, what is that character? Versus those who are claiming to be Muslims holding guns today. And only because you love Ali ibn Abi Talib, they're gonna behead you and they're gonna shoot you. And Allahu Akbar and they shoot you. Tell me. Hmm? You cannot compare. But when you look at such people and say, Subhanallah, this is what humanity needs. We need to uprise at this level where we look at humanity at a different level. But many of us can't handle that diversity of opinion because we ourselves don't know what our religion is. We are afraid to talk about Islam because we are afraid to expose our ignorance. We don't want to talk about it. We change our names even. We just want to assimilate. We want to hide. I advise us all, don't be afraid of truth. Don't be afraid of mankind, Allah said. Fear me. I'm the one who gave you all this grace. Stand up for the truth. Be unafraid. And welcome people. Why is it? And I ask this question all the time. There are almost 8 billion people on earth. Majority of the world has been outside of the fold of Islam in terms of its name. Why? Honestly, why? Is it Allah's design? Is it the design that Allah has dictated that the minority should be believers? No. That defies the mercy of Allah. The reason the minority, okay, is because if you look at us as a minority, we have not reached out to the majority. Often we're silent. Or when we do, there are forces of minorities that silence us. But never stop reaching out. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on Judgment Day will hold us liable. And says, I made you representatives on this earth. As you know in Surah Al-Hajj, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala verse 78 says, لِيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ شَهِيدًا عَلَيْكُمْ وَتَكُونُ شُهَدَ عَلَى النَّاسِ So that the messenger is a witness over you and you are a witness over the people. Therefore uphold prayer. You see? And give charity because that's your obligation. Prayer. All of these factors. Islam is a wonderful gift given to humanity but you notice salah, fasting, what we do in Ramadan, hajj. These are transactional basis that give us a template of what we should be doing. We think that when we pray, we have done God's work. No. We should act what we say in prayer. Otherwise, the prayer is me little meaning. It's like giving oath to something, and then when you're done giving oath, you go back to your satanic ways. Allah says, you just give an oath. When we say, اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين You say that. You ask God. Okay. Then follow the ones who God has chosen. Are you? Are you following their path? This is Islam to me. Honestly, with all due respect, I find our Muslim communities and Christian communities, Jewish communities, Hindus, everybody in general feels entitled to be in their religion. But if we come out of this cocoon and say, come to the common uh, uh, platform, let us find the truth. What do we need to do? Do we foster wars? Do we foster bigotry? Do we fo foster misogynism? Do we foster crazy ideologies that cause harm to societies? And Allah says, that's Islam. If you look at the essence of Islam, it is to promote justice and peace in this world. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. One quick transactional point I want to make. The messenger says, Afdalul ibadah. This is in consonance with this conversation. Afdalul ibadah intadarul mahdi. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. One of the best forms of ibadah is to have the intadar, meaning to have a desire for the Mahdi, for the Imam of the time. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Isra, يَوْمَا نَدْعُوا كُلَّ أُنَاسٍ بِإِمَانِهِمْ فَمَنْ أُوْتِيَ كِتَابُ بِيَمِينِ Here Allah Matabatabai describes يَوْمَا نَدْعُوا On that day, the day of judgment, everybody will be raised with their Imam. كُلَّ أُنَاسٍ بِإِمَانِهِمْ here, by the way, you will notice that the Imam is a pra practical present individual because Quranically, you will see when Allah in verse 59 says, Ya ayyuhaladhin amanu atiu Allah wa atiu rasul wa ulil amri minkum. The two we know, Allah and the Prophet, who are the ones vested with authority? The Quran says, minkum, among you, not among them, among you. And today, that verse stands as it stood then, meaning there is somebody among us who has vested authority over us because it's a present tense, minkum. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares that leadership is an essential component to humanity, whether you know them or not. And I give some quick examples. You notice even corporations, founders of corporations, people like Steve Jobs who founded Apple. When he died, no one says, well, we've got enough of a vision of Steve, you know, Steve Jobs, we understand his mission. It's all encoded. His work is already prevalent in all the iPads and, the, and the, the iPhones. So we don't need a CEO. Thank you. We'll just live on the spirit of Steve Jobs. Everybody will tell you you're out of your mind. In fact, the whole stock will take a nosedive. So I say, why not? He says, well, because you always need a living CEO, not a dead one. So you find, although our prophets and imams are not dead, none of them are dead. Allah says, لا تقول لمن يقتل في سبيل الله أموات بل أحياء ولكن لا تشعرون. Do not say those who die in the way of God are dead. Nay, they are alive, but you do not see them. But a living representative of earth is a command of Allah from the time Adam was put on this earth. We understand that. So the Prophet has said that the Imam of the time will be your witness, even if you don't see him. Same when the Prophet was the Prophet in Mecca and Medina, there were people in China who didn't see him, but he was still their witness because he was spreading the message so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has laid our imam as the living representative this intadhar is very profound I haven't seen the imam a person says I haven't seen the imam how should I follow him I said look at his essence his principles and understand that God has a representative talk about him 
He is not some fictitious person. He has come. History has it. But reflect on such personalities. You have a collection of them. Awaluna wa awsatuna wa akhiruna wa kulluna Muhammad. All of them are Muhammad, right? Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Meaning all the 12 Imams are the Holy Prophet. They are just reflections of the Holy Prophet. They don't bring new laws. Intadhar is very psychological. If our children, if we have intadhar of Imam Ali alayhi salam, we have intadhar of Rasulullah, who is the center of all, who is the leader of all. You have intadhar of Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein, Fatima alayhi salam, Zainab alayhi salam, intadhar, meaning you will now want to be like them. It's like a friend. I have a desire to be with this friend. Today our children have desires to be with the superstars of Hollywood and sports industries because they are very good in doing whatever they do. But on a moral platform, on a holistic platform, no one is better than the prophets and the imams. Intadar. So intadar al-Mahdi. So Allah has put our imam in hiding. Some ask, why is the imam in hiding? Why couldn't God just keep him among us? As you know, he's about 1184 years old in lunar years, 1184 lunar years since he was born. So how old is he? He's over a thousand years old. So why is he around us? How can he be around us? Who can be alive for a thousand years? Scientists will tell you that the human body can live for thousands of years. Just our arteries and our, the flexibility that lies within us is capable of very long life. It's the carcinogens and the poisons that we take and the stress and all of these other attacks that we get in our environments that age us. But otherwise, our bodies are unique. Even those manufactured heart transplants and arteries and veins that are replaced in any form or fashion cannot compete with the natural ones. Natural has a long-term capability. Very, very uh, flexible in its own ways. So to argue how can, Allah says, you didn't exist. They're asking the question, you know, how will God bring us back once we turn to dust? And the argument Allah says in the Quran, you didn't exist before. You were nothing, I made you something. Isn't that a bigger deal? So don't worry about that. So to ask the question, how can an imam live for a thousand years or 15? This is a moot question. Let's put it on the side. Second question to ask is, why did Allah put him in hiding? Now, there are many reasons. As you know, our communities, we would call prophets, we would call imams, and Quran states that you would pray for me to send you help, and then when we send them, you kill them, you torture them, you imprison them, you ignore them. Historical. Every prophet that has come has had their nemesis in society. Karbala is a great example. They call Imam Hussein to Kufa, then they're the same ones who hold the sword to kill Imam Hussein in Karbala. Same scenario. What happens is there comes a time when humanity has been given enough information, enough substance by transaction, by design, by example, that our imams and prophets have had enough of a lesson for us. The Quran is filled with examples of prophets on what they did. How did Yusuf behave? How did Ibrahim behave? How did Musa salam behave? How did, you know, Khidr? How did... Yaqub, how did uh, Ayyub, every prophet in the Quran, Allah calls him a dhikr. Dhikru rahmati rabbika abdahu. Wadhkur fil kitab. Have dhikr. Wadhkur fil kitabi Maryam. Remember Mary, how great she was. Quran says when you remember prophets, it's dhikr. So examples are plenty. Quran is filled with them by any standard. And their successes have been shown without any hesitation beyond any doubt. We have religion. If you and I just do a little tadabbur, we do a little ijtihad within ourselves, and we refer to the scholars, and we refer to the books, and we refer to the imams and the prophets, what they have left us, there is enough guidance in this world today. Allah has taken the imam among us. By the way, he's on earth, he's among us. He transacts with us, but we just don't know who he is. Allah has put him in that state of hidden state. Now you might say, what function does he form? Well, let's give quick answers before time eats it away, this conversation. You find that hiding the imam among us forces us 
to think deeper. It's like you're alone. Your mom and dad always took care of you. Now you're alone. Now you have to figure things out. You have to be independent. You have to stand on your two feet. So you take what was given to you as a model, so you stand on your feet. If the imams were constantly present, they would eclipse ijtihad. We would all be looking at one answer. Whereas now you have maraji who differ on different issues, and they have different rulings on same issues. And we wonder, why are they so different? It's proof ijtihad is alive. They're coming from different angles, understanding the Quran and the Sunnah of Rasulullah and the Hadith. And they're coming to conclusions based on their understanding and examples and experience. I think that's very healthy. Difference of opinion is healthy. It's proof ijtihad is alive. Allah will not punish us because we are different. Allah will punish us if we are complacent, if we are reticent, if we are silent, we don't move to find the truth. If we are lazy, He will punish us. But if we are proactive, He will reward us, even if it's wrong. Even if it's wrong. If the only thing we know, think about it. 500 years ago, spontaneous generation was a scientific theory that life spontaneously generates. Louis Pasteur recently disproved it. That in fact we have bacteria and all kinds of organisms floating in the air that cause what happens when you know, life pops out, out of meat that's rotting. We thought that it just spontaneously generates. Would you say that the scientists 500 years ago were wrong? We would say yes, based on the evidence now they were wrong. But would you say that they were liars? No. What they had, the taklif, what they knew at that time is what they did. But we have been given enough knowledge today to be able to understand the foundation of the deen, which is what's going to be judged on Judgment Day. There's no arguments in that. You and I can never go astray, though the Imam is in hiding, because the foundation of the religion has been established. When the Prophet says, I leave you two heavy things, my book and my Ahlul Bayt. These two shall not separate forever, forever. And they will meet me at the pool of Kawthar. Meaning they are one and the same. There are two dimensions. One is the written, the other is the transactional. Follow them and you will never go astray. Did the Prophet say, no, tomorrow, you know, when your Imam is in hiding, you'll all go astray? No. No. But here's a simple example. If we are Muslims and we doubt the hidden nature of the Imam, then every Muslim believes that shaitan, Iblis, the devil, fools us. Allah says, Alam hadilakum ya bani adam an la ta'abudu shaitan. Inna lakum aduwun mubin. Have we not warned you that do not follow shaitan? He's your great enemy. We all agree with that. I would like to ask the whole human race, how many of you have seen shaitan? We all believe in the devil. Oh, the devil made me do that. You know, there's this devil who's whispering in my ears. Have you seen him? How does he look? What's his shape? We haven't seen it. But we have no problem believing it. He's hidden. But yet he affects us negatively. So why can something hidden and not affect us positively? It's silly. This argument doesn't hold any water. Number one. So the idea that the imam is hidden and therefore he has no effect on me is a moot idea once again because if that which is hidden can also affect us. Let me conclude. What is the function of the imam today? He guides. I believe what's happening in the world today and especially what's happening in the Middle East today and that force that's rising today that's causing even presidents not to have sleep at night and, president, and, and the leaders in Israel who can't sleep at night? Hmm? The Imam is doing his work. Don't be fooled. Trust me, the trajectory of humanity is filled with evil. But what's coming out of it, due to the, the transactions of the, the indomitable people who understand the message of Allah, who have understood the message of Ahlul Bayt, and they stand firm, though the enemy is at the borderlines, and they don't lose, and they kick them out. And they are afraid and they don't know what to do. And they start to make smarter bombs and they start to make smarter guns. But none of that will work because nothing is smarter than the heart. Nothing is smarter than faith. When you rise with faith, nothing can touch you. This is why it's so important in this month of Ramadan. Let's strengthen our faith. Do not lose hope in Allah. Oh no, Allah guarantees inna fatahna laka fathan mubina. I guarantee you victory. Allah says to the Prophet, you've signed this agreement of Hudaybiyah, don't worry, Get, you are guaranteed victory. You will muhalliqeena ru'usakum wa muqassireena la takhafoon fa'alima ma lam ta'alamu fa'ja'ala min duni thalika fathan qariba. They will do halaq 
and taqseer soon don't worry you sign this agreement i promise you allah in surah al-qasas wa nuridu an namunna 'ala alladhina istudhifu fil ard wa naj'alahum a'imma wa naj'alahum al-warithin we promise you it is the desire of god that you shall be the inheritors or you who have been oppressed even biblically it says the meek shall inherit the earth this is nothing new i conclude tonight in transaction our imam is among us he's a witness and he is moving the world the question is what side are we on i end with this story right or wrong doesn't matter the essence of the story is deep rajb ali khayyat in his book elixir of love makes a beautiful point and i want to point that he says there was a man who wants to meet imam mahdi ajallah ta'ala faraj he says i want to go meet him i've heard the hadith that if you go to masjid sahla you read 40 nights you know there's many riwayat not true i mean not untrue it's true even if you read surah bani israil for 40 nights but how you will meet allah alam because he's in ghaiba the imam is in hiding you find what is interesting is he goes he does 40 nights on the 40th night he gets a dream so you want to meet the imam okay go to this city it was in iran he gets on the bus it was a very distant place it wasn't nearby he travels for a whole day tired he gets there doesn't know what to do suddenly some uh, another premonition says to him okay now go to the bazaar go to the trading place and go to a locksmith and wait there you want to meet the imam you can meet him there's a moral to this story and i think it seals the deal in my opinion on everything we talk about we as a community should be cognizant of transactions our akhlaq our deals allah says wallahu basirun bima ta'malun the last part of the verse of surah al-hujurat is god sees what you do and god is not does not disconnect us he's always guiding us always so he's sitting at this he arrives he goes into the locksmith and then there was a handsome young person sitting on the opposite side he doesn't realize who is this maybe maybe not an old woman walks in with a lock and she's selling the lock she goes to the locksmith and says i want to sell this i want some money for it how much will you give me and according to rajul khayyat he says he offers her i think six or seven tuman at that time seven tuman was a lot of money he says i give you seven tuman she says all day i've been trying to sell this no one wants to give me more than four tuman you know you're giving me almost double how is that possible the man looks at her and says lady with all due respect this lock is worth seven tuman if i give you four i'd be cheating you and i can't do that she takes the seven tuman and leaves and that young man looks at him he says you don't need to go to masjid sahla to do 40 nights of zikr to see the imam you need to be like him and the imam visits him meaning that man was the imam and he says you don't have to zikr is good but the greatest zikr is action transaction be honest be trustworthy be giving be caring be sharing be forgiving if you do that the imam says we visit you so tonight i end that i ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the in the knowledge of this great imam that he brings justice and equity and he gives us the tawfiq he gives us the strength to be wise to be upright not to be whimsical and foolish and to be patient that while injustice is so prevalent so many people today are being killed as we speak so many people are being butchered children are being made into orphans as we speak hunger is incredibly high while there's a disparity where people who are obese has even risen in society because there's a there's a there's a mixture here of confusion in society we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us wise to solve the problems for ourselves and those around us to make us good leaders to make us patient individuals loving and caring and to open up these doors there are billions of people out there who have not who don't even know what islam is until you and i welcome them talk to them alhamdulillah today with the geopolitics that karbala imams shia is mentioned sunnah is mentioned islam is being mentioned alhamdulillah on the global front and of course post 9 11 no book was more read on earth than the holy quran the riwayat says the holy prophet says before my grandson who will have my name muhammad when he comes the whole world will have read the quran salawat ala muhammad wa al muhammad 
Let's recite together this dua of Imam Sahib al-Zaman, ajallahu ta'ala farajak, that we ask him, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make his reappearance soon while he's among us, to guide us, to take this darkness away from us, and to bring good leadership among us, so that we bring peace, equity, and to prevent all this carnage and the war that's taking place, the bombings, the Ill indiscriminate bombing that's taking place even in Yemen and in Syria and in all these other places. May Allah, you know, remove this, inshallah. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. Let's recite together. Allahumma kulli walika al-hujjat ibn al-hasan salawatuka alayhi wa ala abai fi hadihi sa'a وفي كل ساعة وليا وحافظا وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أرضك توعا وتمتعه فيها طويلة برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين وصلى الله على محمد وآل الطيبين الطاهرين صلوات على محمد وآل محمد